So I'm Andrew Gillette. I'm very happy today to introduce uh, our speaker from the University of Texas at El Paso, Dr. Natasha Sharma, is here with us. Uh, Dr. Sharma received her PhD from the University of Houston and did a postdoc at Heidelberg, University of Heidelberg in Germany, before beginning her position at UT El Paso, where she was assistant professor and now tenured associate professor. She, I think if we first met uh, at a conference in London at a pub, and uh, I'm very glad that now we're here in a different part of the world uh, in California and happy to have her visiting uh, for a long time this summer. So she's already been here for a number of weeks working on a project related to reinforcement learning for adaptive measure refinement, adaptive measure refinement in the time stepping regime. But that's not what she's talking about today. <laughs> uh, talking about work uh, that she's done previously. I will say, though, that uh, I believe I've convinced her to come over to the MFEM side and maybe an MFEM convert uh, during her time here this summer. So uh, we'd be happy to talk with you uh, at length uh, after the talk. Uh, we're still here a few more weeks. But Natasha, the floor is yours. Um, and you can just tell me when to advance the slides, uh, whatever's. OK. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew, uh, and thanks uh, for this kind invitation to give a talk. And thanks, Susanna, also for all the uh, organization. So, if you feel more comfortable, so you feel free to stand up. And... Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so as mentioned, I will speak about some completed work with um, my collaborator, Amanda. And uh, this work received funding from NSF. And the results, uh, the pretty pictures that you will see were generated using DAC. Uh, I'm going to speak about a couple of applications. And uh, these two applications of the sixth order Kahn billiard type equations um, uh, were published recently um, in December, and um, the other work got published in May uh, this year. So, uh, as mentioned, uh, Amanda is my collaborator here. She's an assistant professor at Mississippi State. Uh, okay, and uh, the key focus of the two applications. Uh, yeah, you can just get the arrow. Yeah. You think I could move? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, the two applications that I want to focus on, uh, the first one here is related to microstructure evolution here. Specifically, we are concerned with the formation of defects as a liquid transitions to a solid or crystalline phase. Uh, the other application that I will be speaking about is uh, called a micro emulsion phase which actually captures the dynamics of ternary uh, or of uh, transition phase transitions in ternary mixtures and it has widespread applications in fields such as enhanced oil recovery and most interesting to us in the design of drug delivery systems so our goal here oh maybe just the arrow <laughs> So our goal here is essentially to focus on um, developing an uh, error analysis uh, for the spatial discretization here with employing well-known uh, convex splitting schemes for the tensional discretization. So that's going to be the main focus of the talk here. And I want to start with the first model here, which captures the microstructure evolution. So uh, when we think about the formation of crystalline materials, uh, they admit defects, which could take form of these point defects or vacancies as they're called. Or they could also take form of line defects that appear along uh, uh, certain lines called dislocations. Or uh, most interesting to us are these uh, gaps that arise between uh, grains of different orientations as uh, the microstructure evolves. So why should we care? So why should we care about uh, the presence of defects in microstructure uh, evolution? Uh, we care about defects because to a great extent they control macroscopic properties such as the electric conductivity, letting us know if a certain material would be a suitable candidate 
for uh, an effective uh, solar panel, uh, the chemical reactivity or even the tensile strength is impacted by uh, the presence of these defects. And so what the goal here is to be able to predict the, our appearance as well as uh, the formation and evolution of these defects. And to aid in this understanding, our approach is to first propose a suitable mathematical model that captures. And the mathematical model of our choice is this continuum model called the phase field crystal equation uh, proposed by Elder and Grant in a 2004 physics paper. And then uh, here is where our contribution comes in, which is to develop an accurate, efficient, and easy to compute uh, numerical scheme that possesses those desirable properties of mass conservation, unconditional stability, uh, unique solvability, and also convergence. Okay, I want to go ahead and explain the space field crystal uh, equation here. So the phase field crystal equation consists of a couple of phases here starting uh, with phi, which denotes our phase field, or I will also call it uh, uh, the atomic density or the number density of atoms that are occupying this um, space uh, within our computational domain omega. In this case here, we have our computational uh, domain to be a square of site 201 by 201. Okay, so I mentioned the two phases here. So the first phase here consists of the liquid phase. And if you notice that uh, in this picture here, we have it filled with a specific shade of purple, which is denoting the um, density of the liquid phase. Uh, it's set to be this constant value 0.285. And it's well, uh, so here this uh, liquid phase is representing uh, a supercooled liquid here. And it's well known that if I have a supercooled liquid, then in the absence of a seed crystal, it's not going to transition to a solid or crystalline phase. So to initialize that kind of transition, we introduce these seed crystals, uh, which are included in these square notches. They are placed at three random locations and they have differently oriented uh, uh, pure crystallites within them. And so this solid phase represented by these three square uh, notches, they are represented by a spatially varying periodic function uh, value for our phase P P. And this inherits the symmetry and the periodicity of the crystal lattice here. So then the, uh, the dynamics of transitioning from this liquid phase to the solid or crystalline phase uh, is given by the following conservation law here, where we note that um, M denotes the mobility coefficient assumed to be a uh, constant. Mu here represents the chemical potential calculated by taking uh, the cation derivative of E, which denotes our energy, given by the following uh, integral. I'd like to note here that uh, epsilon here is not related to the interfacial thickness, but rather a water parameter associated uh, with the temperature. And so when I uh, when we calculate the Fox variation of the energy plug everything back into this uh, conservation law, we come about with the phase P crystal equation, which is given by this fixed order non-linear time-dependent uh, uh, equation uh, cast in the spatio-temporal domain, where T here represents our final time. Now, in order to solve it, we rewrite it uh, in terms of a parabolic equation and uh, in terms of this differential equation, which involves the nonlinearity as well as uh, this 
by harmonic term here. We further go ahead and uh, augment this with either uh, the periodic boundary conditions or the naturally occurring homogeneous Neumann type boundary conditions imposed on P, its Laplacian, and on the chemical potential mu. We also use the notation of P naught to represent the uh, initial value as well as uh, follow some standard notation of HS to denote the sublab spaces of the differential order S and Z to be the specific subspace of the H2 space with vanishing normal type uh, boundary conditions. So with this notation in mind, um, it's uh, well known that the weak formulation here admits uh, admits a solution. This was something uh, proved by Paolo and co-authors in this 2030 uh, signing uh, paper. And uh, I note here uh, that this uh, uh, weak solution exists under the following regularities, where each sub n negative one denotes the dual space of, uh, of z here. Furthermore, uh, the angular brackets denote the dual pairing, uh, round brackets denote the standard L2 inner products here. And most importantly here, A denotes the Frobenius inner products between the Hessians associated with U and V here. And it's calculated by applying integration by parts twice to that biharmonic term. Also uh, note that here, for the existence of this weak solution, Paolo and co-authors assumed an H4 regularity on the initial condition. Okay, so now when we come to the design of a numerical scheme, we are confronted with a couple of challenges. So the obvious challenge here is related to the fourth order derivatives that are lurking in this biharmonic term here. So we want to choose a spatial discretization that's going to take care of these higher order derivatives. And uh, we don't want it to be too expensive or too hard to compute. So if we go with the traditional C1 confirming method, of course, uh, we're going to involve several degrees of freedom associated with each element here. The other challenge that we face here is that if we just naively use a classical method such as a backward Euler, then we have this severe uh, restriction on the relation between the time step and the mesh size. So we want to remove this and have some kind of an unconditional stability as well as solvability. Now to this end, if we look in the existing literature at the uh, methods, that are available. Uh, the very first work dates back to this 2007 uh, paper by these physicists where we did what would come naturally, that's rewrite this fixed order system as three second uh, order systems. And then uh, these authors used um, a backward Euler and linearized uh, the non-linearity uh, about the previous time step information. So in this paper, it was just simulations, no analysis uh, or uh, uh, addressing uh, well posedness. Uh, next came a whole flurry of finite element framework developed uh, mainly by Weiss and co-authors, uh, uh, starting with this being one of the first uh, works here. Uh, there was also uh, an isogeometric analysis uh, presented in this 2012 paper by Gomez and Aguera. And uh, finally, we had uh, some LDG approaches as well as some Fourier spectral methods uh, advice, where the focus mainly was more on the temporal discretization. Okay, so uh, in our approach here, we obviously don't want to go with a C1 uh, method, but rather relax this uh, constraint and go with a C0 uh, method. 
And as far as the temporal discretization is concerned, we employ the well-known IRS convex splitting scheme, which would yield a unique solvability and unconditional stability here. So I'll start with the spatial discretization and uh, our computational domain, which is assumed to be a bounded polygonal, is subdivided into these cells here. For our case, we are taking these cells to be a uh, triangle. Uh, we assume geometric uh, conforming and shape regular partition. So we adopt the standard notation of HK representing the diameter. Uh, with H representing the max and EH representing the collection of all edges here. So before I describe our C0 interior penalty method, I want to quickly uh, uh, go from the traditional method and then show how C0 interior penalty differs. So if we reconsider the weak formulation, then the classical C1 method amounts to seeking a finite dimensional uh, uh, approximation spaces VH in H1 and ZH in essentially H2, uh, such that the continuous in time approximation for the phase scheme and the chemical potential satisfy the following uh, uh, equations here. And uh, this is satisfied uh, for all choices of test functions, namely VH times ZH here. Notice that going from infinite to finite dimension, there was absolutely no change in this Frobenius inner product involving the Hessians of the first and the second component here. Now, what we do as said, uh, we relax the C1 continuity. So we still do require uh, the approximation space for the chemical potential to be uh, continuous. However, we drop the C1 continuity requirement and merely require the approximation space for our phase speed to just be H1. And with this, um, we can do so, but it comes at the cost of replacing this Frobenius inner product with this mesh-dependent bilinear form here. Now, I'll explain this mesh-dependent bilinear form in a moment, but first I'll go ahead and describe the choice of these spaces VH and ZH that we are considering here. So VH is our standard P1 Lagrange uh, finite element space. ZH is the lowest uh, order possible, permissible order uh, solution space approximating the phase E, that's our uh, quadratic Lagrange phases. I also want to uh, introduce the uh, projection operators that we will be employing uh, as we go on to describing our numerical scheme. These are the RH and PH rich, rich projection operators corresponding to the chemical potential and the phase E here. And so with this in mind, uh, we describe the mesh-dependent bilinear form, essentially uh, derived by applying integration by parts twice to our biharmonic uh, term here. And when we apply integration by parts twice uh, for functions which are essentially living in the P2 Lagrange space, then uh, we can uh, carry out this integration by parts locally, but this comes at the cost of non-vanishing edge-based terms. So these edge-based terms are described by J, and they consist of terms that pop up due to the integration by parts. And here we use the standard DG notation of jumps and averages. Uh, the second term here that you see pop, uh, pops up or is included to ensure that the resulting matrix is going to be symmetric, while this third term, which is uh, weighted alpha, which is our penalty parameter, is added for stability and weakly enforcing uh, the Neumann boundary conditions here. Uh, it's also well established that this uh, that we can find constant C quant and C core such that um, our, our mesh, uh, our, our bi 
linear, uh, bilinear form is continuous and coercive with respect to this 2H norm that is defined in terms of this broken H27 norm here and the uh, penalty term uh, rated by this penalty parameter at bar. Okay. Uh, now I go on to independently describe our time discretization here. So we partition our temporal domain into these M sub intervals, each possessing the, the same length tau. Uh, we use these superscripts N to denote uh, entities at time the M, and we let this delta sub tau denote our numerical derivative with respect to the time step size tau. So with this notation in mind, I want to describe our convex time splitting scheme here. So the basic idea as described on this slide is that uh, the energy which is used to define the chemical potential is split into a convex and a concave part where we treat the convex part uh, implicitly and treat the concave part explicitly. Uh, I may have forgotten to mention this, but epsilon need not be a positive constant. Epsilon is just a modern parameter that's assumed to be strictly smaller than one. Here. Okay, so uh, here is our energy. And so this term here is clearly a uh, negative of a convex function and hence it's going to be lagged in time while the rest of the terms are taken at current time. And that's reflected in uh, how we treat the, the first three terms here and how we treat this last term. So just independently, our temporal discretization appears as follows, where uh, the boundary conditions are satisfied at each time step. And so our fully discrete scheme is as described here, where initially we project our uh, initial value P naught and mu naught uh, mu naught onto the approximation spaces. It's not very difficult to see that if we choose the, um, uh, the test function mu to be one, we retrieve the mass conservation here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and quickly describe the properties of this scheme. So what first pops up is the unique solvability. Uh, and thanks to the IELTS convex splitting scheme, we are easily able to establish unconditional stability. And so our main contribution here is in deriving the optimal error estimates uh, for our proposed scheme. So one aspect related to the solvability uh, requires the introduction of this convex functional here, which is given in terms of this negative 1H norm that's commonly used in um, uh, the uh, analysis arguments here. This negative 1H norm is defined uh, in terms of grad and this discrete inverse Laplacian operator TH, uh, which maps from this space ZH not to ZH, and essentially is what uh, 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 is taking the inverse of the Laplacian here. The space ZH not is uh, the subspace of ZH consisting of uh, zero mu here. Uh, and we use this functional here in the proof of our unique solvability. So, so um, essentially the idea of showing the unique solvability is to introduce a zero mean formulation for our scheme, establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between the zero mean formulation uh, and the solution to our scheme. And so then the burden of proof is on showing the establishment of a solution to the zero mean formulation. And that's where that convex functional GH comes in. And so the solution to the zero mean formulation turns out to be the minimizer for this uh, convex function. 
Uh, now I'll go on to describing the statement of the unconditional stability, which holds true for any choice of the uh, method parameters h and tau. I'd also like to remark that even the uh, unique solvability holds true for any of the method parameters and any choice of the model parameter epsilon smaller than one. Um, so yeah, so for any um, method parameters, we have a decay in the energy. And as a consequence of this decay, under the assumption that the initial energy uh, is bounded by some constant C, or which is independent of uh, the mesh size, we are able to uh, derive these a priori estimates uh, provided our temperature-related parameter epsilon satisfies this condition where C core is the coercivity constant here. And it's important to note that we derive these uniform um, upper bounds uh, independent of uh, the method parameters and, or the final time. Okay, so with this in mind, uh, I can go on to uh, describe briefly uh, the error estimates, emphasizing on the key challenge that we faced in uh, deriving these uh, estimates here. So we make the following assumptions on um, the uh, phase field, the chemical potential, and the temporal derivatives. We recall that the norm under which we will be measuring uh, the uh, error is this 2H norm, given in terms of the H2 semi-norm and this penalization term here. We also adopt this notation of the error uh, between uh, the phase field and the chemical potential being given by E superscripted uh, as shown here. And for ease of presentation, we we'll assume that the uh, mobility is one. Okay, so typically the uh, heart of any error analysis involves an error equation. And uh, the error equation involves a subtraction between the weak form and the, approx uh, the uh, approximation forms here. So for us, we would subtract equation three from one to arrive at the error equation. Uh, that's not very difficult to do, thanks to the fact that our uh, space pH is actually sitting inside uh, the H, H1 space here. So um, uh, we are able to derive a relation of this form by artificially introducing uh, the numerical uh, derivative of uh, P at time M on both sides. Now if we try to carry out the same for our algebraic equation, two and four, then we run into a little uh, problem here. And the main problem comes because we relax that C1 continuity. So ZH is no longer a subspace of Z. In fact, if we actually try to carry out the subtraction with a choice of the test function psi postponed, then um, we would have an expression of this form where um, we are unable to decide how to choose psi, right? Because if we choose psi to be just living in Z, then uh, psi doesn't have sufficient regularity to support terms, uh, those edge-based functions uh, called, uh, that arise in our bilinear form here. But on the other hand, if we choose psi to be just these quadratic uh, continuous elements, then it has insufficient regularity to have a global definition of the essence associated uh, or involved in this forbiddance in a product here. So then what we do here, uh, what we do here is we choose our test function psi to be in the Lagrange, uh, quadratic Lagrange space, and then we lift it 
to be living into a subspace of H2. So um, uh, this, uh, we are not new at this approach. This was already done uh, by Brenner, Goody, and so more than a decade ago. Um, but uh, we do so by introducing this uh, H2 finite dimensional HCP finite element space. And we carry out this lifting by means of this enriching operator that lifts those test functions living in ZH into this H2 conforming space. And so now our weak form can be written, uh, defined for elements living in this P2 Lagrange space uh, with the lifting introduced here to uh, compensate for the lack of regularity possessed by this ZH space. And this is done so by this second algebraic equation here, where we note that this right-hand side here represents our correction term, given in terms of these terms involving psi H minus this uh, enrichment operator. And it turns out the solution to this weak form with the correction term is, uh, is uh, consistent with the solution to the original weak form. And that's thanks to the observation that the uh, bilinear form and the propenius inner product are the same here uh, if tested with this enriched uh, test function stack. Okay. So with this at hand, we can carry out that subtraction. We can uh, break down or decompose our error into the projection error and the remaining uh, remainder term here. And uh, if we uh, choose the test functions, psi, uh, mu and psi in such a way that we can eliminate this last term here and this first term here, uh, then we arrive at the key error equation. And uh, moving forward from here uh, involves using a bunch of inequalities, uh, such as the Cauchy, Shaw's inequality, Young's inequality, and a bunch of lemmas that allow us to bound several terms, rewrite uh, the second third and fourth terms using polarization identities. And I'm gonna skip those details here, but I'll be happy to revisit it after uh, uh, I finish my presentation. Uh, uh, I'd also like to mention here that we will heavily be relying on uh, an estimate given in terms of that negative one H norm introduced when I discussed unique solvability. And so, as I mentioned, I will skip these details. A uh, bunch of them exist. And also mention that we separately treat that correction term fancy L here, uh, where a bound for the fancy L correction term is given in terms of oscillations. That's uh, defined in the classical adaptive mesh uh, refinement uh, sense. And uh, in terms of this Young's inequality uh, beta, that makes an appearance. So this lemma provides an upper bound for any choice of beta. And then what we actually do is put all the estimates together. And sorry, I'm going to skip these slides here because I won't be able to do justice. Um, to arrive at our main uh, uh, first order uh, 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 convergence uh, estimate here. Uh, it tells us that uh, at any uh, time step size L, we have this uh, estimate where it's important to note that this coefficient C star uh, might depend on the oscillations involving uh, the chemical potential or its temporal derivative of first order and final stopping time. But importantly, it's independent of the method parameters uh, H of time. Okay, so, so to, before I present our numerical uh, results, I just want to quickly recall what we are doing uh, in our um, implementation. 
the implementation was carried out in the Phoenix project and FireDrake. We start by projecting our initial solution, uh, our initial value onto the solution space. And then at each time step, we are solving uh, this system for the phase field and the chemical potential. At each time step here, we end up with this nonlinear system. Uh, and we solve it by uh, using the inbuilt Newton solver here. We also note that for the two numerical examples that I present, the uh, epsilon, which is uh, related to the temperature, is set at this value, and the mobility is assumed to be 1. The metal parameter alpha is set to be uh, 20. So yeah, as mentioned, we are using this Newton solve. It's observed that uh, the uh, number of iterations needed does not exceed three. We set the tolerance to be 10 to the negative uh, six and our guesses to be the solutions at the previous time step. Okay, as a first numerical experiment, uh, we do an accuracy test here. We're considering a square of size 32, final stopping time 10 and our initial condition taken from uh, this paper by Weiss and co-authors. And here we are actually trying to uh, see if first order convergence is numerically also observed here. So it's well known that for these uh, nonlinear equations, the exact solution is not known. So we consider the solution on what we consider the finest mesh, that's uh, assuming 512 subdivisions along each side of the square. Uh, for recording our uh, for reporting our convergence, we set uh, the time step size uh, uh, to be this proportion of the mesh step size. Although you'll see on the next slide, this is not necessary. And uh, we report the error here measured in this two H norm, as well as the error in uh, the chemical potential approximation measured in the standard H one norm here. So what we observe is that we get the expected linear convergence in approximating the phase field as well as the chemical potential. So uh, I mentioned unconditional stability that's numerically observed here. So uh, we chose time step size uh, to be these proportions of the mesh step size, and we notice a uh, dissipation in the energy. Uh, here we presented it uh, for uh, calculations carried out on a mesh uh, where the subdivision of uh, the uh, spatial domain included 256 subdivisions along each um, side of the square here. Okay, I want to go back to the prototypical example here. So um, we recall that we have this super cool liquid which possessed a uniform uh, atomic density of about 0.285. That's given by this shade of purple. Uh, and this is represented by this P bar term here. And I also mentioned that at this random location, we introduce these square notches, which possess pure crystallites of random orientation. This example made an appearance in this gomez Navera paper here. And we take our computational domain to be the square of size 201 by 201. So with this initial configuration, we're expecting to see uh, the capturing of the transition from the liquid phase to the solid phase as well as the motion of how the inter, um, uh, interfaces evolve between the evolution of these three crystallites as they spread. So on this slide here, we start with time zero, and then we see the evolution over time steps, uh, snapshots at time step 10, 500, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000. What we see with the evolution of time is, uh, of course, these crystallites, the transition takes place from the liquid to the solid phase here. And what also evolves are the presence of these green boundaries 
Um, uh, and what we notice here is uh, the familiar looking trigentry, which is what our practitioners uh, expect to see when you have these kind of green defects that appear between differently oriented trees here. So that uh, summarizes what we did for the phase PD crystal equation. Our current work in this area is uh, not just to have uh, the capturing of the microstructure evolution uh, in the diffusive time scale, as is shown through the PFC equation, but uh, we also want to incorporate elastic interactions, and that's through the modified phase field crystal equation. And the numerical analysis for that uh, is uh, complete, um, again, by Amanda and me here. Yeah. Okay, now I want to shift gears and come to uh, another uh, application of the sixth order convenient type equation here, where we consider two immiscible fluids, let's say oil and water. And uh, we typically expect to see a phase separated mixture of these two fluids. But what if we want to have a mixture of these two immiscible fluids, where the individual properties of these fluids are retained, uh, but there is a stability associated with this mixture. Okay, so uh, this can be achieved by introducing a third component here, which is called a surfactant. This is a surface active molecule, which when uh, added to this space separated mixture, leads to the emergence of a third phase, which is called a micro margin phase. And uh, this phase appears because the surfactant reduces the surface tension that exists at the interface between the oil and water. And it does so by uh, the, uh, because it possesses these water-loving heads and uh, these oil-loving tails. And the, between the interface, it forms these monolayers that holds everything together in a thermodynamically stable way uh, for several years to come. So now this emergence of this third phase called the micro emergent phase has been a very attractive property and um, practitioners have found several applications such as the enhanced oil recovery in the design of cosmetics or cleaning products and as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, most uh, importantly for us in the design of drug delivery system. So one such drug that um, is uh, uh, of our interest is this commonly known uh, local anesthetic uh, that you find over the counter, let's say at Walgreens. So if you look at the label of this drug here, it possesses these uh, petrochemical ingredients. And so what uh, is happening these days is that uh, there is a drive for running to more uh, sustainable or transitioning to more sustainable or ecologically friendly uh, sourced ingredients uh, without actually compromising on the functionality of the local anesthetic itself. So one such endeavor involved um, uh, 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 is uh, one such endeavor that my colleagues are at UTEP are involved uh, is at this Navi Lab of Bioengineered Therapeutics. And, uh, and here uh, they are involved with running these wet lab experiments to see which proportions of which um, responsibly for uh, ingredients would lead to the best performance of uh, the drug here. And to aid in this very expensive experiments, we want to provide uh, computational tools uh, to help uh, uh, these practitioners or uh, the experimentalists uh, better understand the impact of the ingredients and the proportions of the ingredients. So this is an ongoing work which motivated us to examine and develop uh, 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 an accurate and efficient scheme to capture these dynamics. So once again, uh, we consider or assume that our computational domain is rounded polygonal, 
Here, our phase B is represented by the scalar order parameter, representing the difference between the uh, two invisible phases, which here are the oil and the water phase here. So uh, for our calculations, we'll assume negative one, one to represent the water oil phase. And once a uh, surfactant is introduced, then uh, we have the emergence of this third phase called the micro phase. And at that interface here, we have equal proportions for the oil and water. So that's why the phase B value P equals zero represents that micro emulsion phase. Now, the energy associated with this system is our second order Ginsburg Glendale free energy. It has these two components representing a certain competition between them. The first integral here represents a tendency to mix involving these derivatives here, uh, where we note that lambda is a positive constant um, model parameter controlling the bending energy here uh, as it builds uh, in front of this uh, Laplacian uh, second order term here. And then we have this tendency to separate into these uh, pure phases here, weighted by this positive constant beta. So this model was introduced by uh, Romper and co-authors in a series of papers here. And um, uh, here we are merely representing the local difference. The surfactant is eliminated uh, from this system. But I must remark there are other models which introduce surfactant as another uh, scalar order parameter here. So once again, the conserved dynamics obeys the following uh, law here. We again have the standard notation here of J representing that mass flux. M is the mobility again assumed to be a constant. And uh, U here, which is involved in the max flux, flux definition, is obtained by uh, taking the Gatlow derivative of this uh, energy. It turns out to be this functional here, uh, which involves non-linearity not only in the scalar order parameter, but it's for other derivatives. Um, and so when we plug everything back in here, we arrive yet again at this sixth order non-linear evolutionary equation. And uh, this is cast in the spatial temporal domain. Uh, for solvability purposes, we do write it as a second order and a fourth order nonlinear equation. Again, we are augmented it with the natural um, homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions. And uh, once again, Paolo and co authors discussed the existence, uh, the well-posedness of this system for constant choice of mobility uh, in this 2011 paper. So we again looked at what has been done for this uh, micro imagining system here. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, not much. There was uh, the only known existing work was a fully implicit backward Euler method um, by my uh, PhD advisor, Poppy, uh, and uh, Christopher Lindemann, and here a backward Euler in conjunction with a C0 interior penalty method was adopted, but only quasi-optimal uh, uh, quasi error estimates were derived, and there was no discussion about properties of this scheme, such as um, uh, unconditional stability um, um, and such. Uh, we also saw that we were, uh, Amanda and I were the only ones who worked on a closely related uh, model. And so inspired by the success in applying this, uh, we went ahead and tried to uh, do the same for this sixth order Kahn-Hilliard type model. So we were able to do it except for the fact that our energy here did not admit a natural decomposition into a convex and concave part. And that was essentially due to the, sorry, that was essentially due to the, uh, we were unable to carry out that convex splitting due to the appearance of this uh, non-linearity in the first order uh, derivatives. So uh, I'll skip uh, certain details of the derivation 
But uh, for whichever terms we were able to carry out a contact splitting, we did so. But for this term here, we did what comes naturally, which is lag the nonlinearity in the higher order derivative and uh, consider the remaining term of current of that steps. This also worked out well for us because um, uh, it satisfied a certain discrete law that made it easy to establish the unconditional stability here. Okay, so I'm just going to state the results in the interest of time here. So under the following assumption on the coefficient of the by harmonic term, we were able to establish the existence of a solution. We note that P naught bar here is the uh, average of the initial mass. CP1 here denotes that point care constant. Um, and uh, this solution exists for any choice of the method parameters here. We also observed that for any choices of the model parameter or method parameter, we have a dissipation of uh, the energy. And under the following assumption, again made on that coefficient of the bedding energy, we are able to derive our a priori uh, estimates. That it's important to note that these upper bounds are independent of H tau or capital T. Uh, and we note that we not only used one type of point care uh, uh, inequality, but a second kind of point care inequality in deriving these results. And the unique solvability here is shown yeah. in a unique way by using the uniform a priori estimates to uh, to actually help us show the uniqueness of the solution, where we have a third point care inequality coming here. And it's important to note that this C star again was coming from the previous slide. And once again, uh, this is unique for any choice of the method parameters. So, again, before I go on to showing our numerical results here, I uh, want to quickly recall what we're actually doing in the implementation. So we project our initial value at each time step. We have this resulting um, uh, system of equations, nonlinear equations. And for the remaining of uh, the numerical experiments that you see, we are choosing these um, parameter, model parameters to be uh, these specific values. Um, and we are able to actually take a lower penalty parameter, at this time to be just eight. And as was uh, done in the PFC case, uh, we uh, rely on the inbuilt Newton solver and uh, we set our tolerance as shown here. Initial guess to be the solution at the previous time step. And we observed a maximum of three Newton equations taken at each time step. Okay, so I first, uh, although I did not speak about the linear convergence, we do observe it. So we take our initial solution as shown here. Our computational domain is chosen to be a square of this side, stopping time at 0.4. The mobility here is taken to be 10 to the negative 3, and that coefficient of an bending energy is taken to be 1. So here, we take our exact solution to be the one calculated on the grid consisting of 256 subdivisions. Um, in this first column here, we have uh, the subdivisions that we consider in reporting the um, uh, error history measured for uh, the scalar order parameter in the 2H as well as the L2 norm here. And we observe that we certainly get the linear convergence and the quadratic convergence for the 2H and the L2 norm here. Uh, once again, we take the time step size to be some proportion of the mesh step size here. Uh, and for our next example, we take the same initial condition 
but we expand our spatial and temporal uh, domain so as to notice the long-term behavior of the energy function here. So this is the scale. Uh, uh, this is the energy which involves this constant term. So we scale it by subtracting this con uh, constant term so that we notice that energy dissipation for any choice of time step size. So we take the different time step sizes as mentioned here. And on this slide here, we are presenting the scaled total energy as a function of the log of the time here to see that the energy is dissipating. And for these calculations, we set, we set the spatial uh, discretization to include 128 subdivisions along each side of the square. Next, I'll come uh, to actually simulating the micro uh, emulsion, uh, emulsion processes. And uh, this example here was uh, done with the aid of microlabulators in the wet lab, where for actual experiments, they have a continuum medium of the surfactant uh, that reduces the surface tension. And then these droplets of oil-based drug ingredients and water-based uh, drug ingredients are introduced. Uh, they are indicated by these uh, red and these blue dots, respectively. Here, the time scale on which the dynamics appears requires just final time 3.1. So to be able to show this, we took a square of side 10 here. And uh, the green shade here represents the continuum of the surfactant. So on the next slide here, we see the evolution of uh, the dynamics here, starting at uh, times 0 to 3, moving forward to times 4, oops, uh, times 4 to 25. And we notice that um, the time scales here are already quite different on which the uh, morphosis appears. And here what we notice is between these pure regions of pure oil and pure water, we have this monolayer, this green monolayer, which is actually representing the presence of this surfactant that's holding this third phase all together while retaining the individual properties of the oil and the water-based nucleus. We also notice that between, let's say, uh, uh, times 74 and 511, there's not too much dynamic, uh, too much uh, difference the way we noticed in the previous uh, dynamics here. And so, uh, our takeaways for this model were that there are different technical scales or, uh, which capture uh, the morphologies of different phases here, and that one size of the time step size doesn't um, fit all the dynamics here. And so we really need to calculate a suitably chosen, adaptively chosen time step size that um, uh, is uh, going to accurately represent the dynamics of each phase. And it would be efficient to take larger time steps, let's say between 74 and 511, while smaller or finer time steps initially. This is one of the reasons I came here to work with Andrew and his team on these aspects of the model. And with that, I want to come to the concluding slide here. So we presented the C0 interior penalty framework with an emphasis on the error analysis. Well, our current token challenge here is to be able to choose our parameters in an optimal manner, specifically the ones associated with the temporal discretization. And so that's going to be my focus moving forward. We hope reinforcement learning has some answers for us. And I do want to thank you all for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Natasha. I think a few people had to leave um, due to the time, but uh, everyone is here. If you have questions uh, online, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask, or we also have some people here in the room.
Yeah. Can you go back to the, the, the slide that had the um, uh, the plots of energy dissipation versus time? Uh, time? Yes. Was that uh, that's energy dissipation versus time? Log and, of time. And, and then the uh, log of time. And then those are different time steps you're taking? Yes. So, you're, so your, your method is very, it looks like it's quite dependent on the size of the path you take. That's right. Um, so in addition to optimize the, the, you know, the efficiency of your method, you're actually just trying to get the right answer, right? From, so, yeah. yes. So it might take longer, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then what is the correct energy dissipation for this, this system? Is it, you know, is, is the smaller, are the smaller time steps actually? So, uh, so yeah. So all we know theoretically, is that the energy uh, that us um, maybe search for uh, the mm -hmm. uh, solutions of the energy dissipation and uh, of course the rates of the decay is yeah. what we don't know how quickly they are right, right, right. Uh, decreasing. Yeah, That's interesting. That's not an easy problem. <laughs> <laughs> Only the hard problems are left. Yeah, yeah, that's the hard part, yeah. Other questions? Uh, hey, Natasha, this is uh, Hanyu. Can you hear me? A very nice talk. You're cutting up. Wait, what? I'm cutting. Oh, go ahead. It cut out for a second. Oh, OK. This might be the internet. Thank you for your talk. It's really nice. I wonder, because you mentioned that the time step really affect your solution, and then you showed a priori estimate. Will you be able to derive posterior? Uh, posteriori estimates that would, you know, adapt your time step accordingly based on the a posteriori error? So, yes. So we haven't uh, looked into that aspect, but uh, we do expect that with some um, residual diff driven choice of uh, time step size, we will be able to uh, 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 we will be able to uh, get uh, the mm -hmm. uh, a better, uh, a more suitable time step. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The the other question I have is the system you showed is really is a nonlinear system. So I I don't usually see using the error measure, uh, uh, I use the energy norm as the error measure for the nonlinear system because they they sometimes could be degenerate. Uh, so I. I I was wondering if you can clarify why you you still choose the energy norm as a uh, as the error measure. So, right. So for right now, we um, so so for right now, we wanted to um, see if the spatial discretization carried out by the C zero IP method would be suitable. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't actually. Could you emphasize on the degenerate cases? Would this be like the log? Degenerate. Uh, I mean, degenerate. Like I, I've come from cell oil and gas um, background, so okay. so like if you do two phase flow, the permeability, the related permeability could go to zero at, at certain saturations, and that would make the energy norm go to zero. But you want the energy norm to still be bounded below by a positive constant, right? Right, 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 right. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so uh, unfortunately, we haven't looked at these interesting cases. Certainly, then we will need to incorporate uh, other factors to accurately represent uh, such cases. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, yeah, we have just looked at uh, varying it. Uh, we are not varying it spatially or dependent on uh, the uh, phase speed fee. So this is just our first step. And uh, yeah, it will be. Mm. She, she cut out or I cut out. Oh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Some the owls sort of flickering on top. Oh, OK. <laughs> The message was, uh, yes, something to look into. Yeah. So well, I, I heard all the answers. Thank you very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions?
Sorry to harp on this plot again. Uh, Go ahead. Why do they all start at, start at different energies? Uh, because they are... Uh, oh, why do they start at different energies? Actually, they all start at different times, too. I had this question, too. Yes. <laughs> we thought that maybe it was... It recorded only the first time step and didn't record time step zero. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Or time step zero. Yeah. Because, yeah, 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 yeah you think it all start the same energy. Yeah. Yeah. And they all end in the same energy, which is good news. Yeah. yeah. Which is good. That's good news. So you're yeah. yeah. getting there at a different amount of time. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 thanks. Yeah. 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 You showed me this before. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll say again, uh, Natasha's here for a few more weeks in person. And if you'd like to meet with her, uh, you can reach out to her directly through email or, or through me. Um, she has an office in 671, but she's also over here in 451 often uh, meeting with me. Um, thank you all for attending and uh, have a good day.